Hi, welcome to the introductory video for the Emerging Leaders Institute for Training and Excellence, more commonly known to all of us as ELITE. My name is Lil Dupree. And I'm Denise Harlow. And together we are the TNTA team at the Community Action Partnership in Washington, D.C. This is the first video in a series for emerging leaders that explore topical areas, uh, projects you can do as emerging leaders, different tools that you can use to help emerging leaders grow. It's intended for use to start an emerging leaders program in your association or in your agency and put that to use. So without further ado, let's go ahead and talk about those content areas. We want people, uh, all leaders, whether they're in community action or otherwise, to have a certain base of knowledge, whether they're going to be program leaders or fiscal leaders, whether they're going to be CEOs of agencies uh, or run development departments. And public administration is sort of the foundation for how nonprofits and governments typically work together. Strategic planning, you know, if you don't have a plan, any road will take you to your destination, right? Fiscal integrity, even non-fiscal people have to have a good sense of what happens um, in the fiscal world in their agency. Human resource development, this is part of it, emerging leadership, but there is more to it. Community relations. Community action in particular has a very special role in how it relates to the communities it serves. Maximum feasible participation is only really um, the first layer of that. Performance management. Learning mm -hmm. from our data. Seeing what we need to do to make changes to do a better job. Uh, and then, of course, cultural competency. We don't work in a homogenous world. And as much as we would all wish it, as you'll hear in that video, we do not yet live in a post-racial society. How do we work on those issues? in a coordinated, understanding, and effective manner. So Elite really has a couple of components beyond the curriculum videos. One is peer mentoring. Emerging leaders work best um, in terms of these curriculum in a group. We can talk about the issues, study together, and work through some of the forms together. The final form, we'll tell you about some others, is the comprehensive individual development plan. This is the roadmap that emerging leaders, and frankly, any leaders. Mm -hmm. I still have an IDP, Denise. Yep, same here. It's a little dusty at the moment, you know, but still. How do we want to develop as leaders? And it's important for people to use that to create their map for moving forward. So let's talk a little bit about leadership itself. Let's talk to a little bit long, a little bit on mentoring, if I could, just for, Please, for a minute. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure you have, but I know in my life, I've had professional mentors at every point in time along my career path. And just emphasizing that if you're doing this either at an agency or at an association, really mm -hmm. finding that quality time for peer-to-peer -peer gathering, peer-to-peer -peer discussions um, is incredibly valuable. Um, a mentor and a coach mm -hmm. kind of serve different roles, but just wanted to stress a little bit more mm -hmm. that mentoring component. If you're going to replicate this in your state or association, or if you're actually in the process of doing this right now, hope you find a mentor. Search one out. Ask someone formally. People are oftentimes um, flattered to be asked to mm -hmm. be a mentor. Um, it doesn't... It, it takes a little bit of work on both sides, but it, it's an incredibly important part. Indeed it is, and thank you. So let's talk for a minute about what is leadership. In the grand old tradition of writing essays that started back in high school for all of us, you know, sometimes you go to the dictionary or now you go to the online dictionary and look up what a word means. So as we think about leadership, this is what Merriam-Webster has to say. And I'd like to ask, have you ever seen a more useless <laughs> description of a word what do they tell you when you're writing definitions? You shouldn't use the, the core word in the definition of another word. Exactly. So, yeah. This really doesn't tell us very much. So I always like to turn to one of the best management consultants in the business. Let's see what uh, Mr. Dilbert has to say about leadership. Too often what we see put comically in the cartoon actually happens out in real life. We decide who the next leader is going to be, and then we crown them with the jewel, and then we, you know, we move forward. That is not what we're talking about when we talk about leadership development, particularly for emerging leaders. Um, so we would say that's not what, where we want to go from here. And I know um, we've been talking a lot about leadership, and we're going to get into leadership, but there's a lot of difference between management skills and leadership skills, right? There are. There is. is dif there are differences. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about those because the reality is it's no more management versus leadership. Right. We all have to do some of both, especially in the community action world where our resources are always more limited than the need, especially, you know, in these uh, 2013, 2014 years mm -hmm. where, you know, the need continues to increase despite the increasingly better economic outlook. 
but yet things aren't better for folks um, in a low-income situation. So we have to do more with less. We don't have room for people who just leave us. Right. We have to in agencies and in associations, and here's the partnership, we're working managers and leaders all at the same time. So let's talk a little bit about those um, differences. The core of the manager's job is what you see on the screen. It's to do stuff. It's to make stuff happen. Um, reducing it to sort of basic English and common denominators. The leader's job is to inspire, to motivate, as you see on screen, to get people sort of moving in the same direction, even to gin up excitement around those. Let's talk, though, a little more, and Denise, if you would, about the jobs of managers and leaders, the things that we need to do at different points in our day, sometimes our week, sometimes in our hours. And I think for emerging leaders, as you're going down your career path and you're thinking about ways that you want to add new skill sets, certainly the management components are very tangible, right? They, they, there tend to be classes, there tend to be workbooks, there are texts written on a lot of these areas, right? Administering a program, administering an agency. Both sides of these, both of these columns are incredibly important, and probably equally important to have a good leader in an organization. You have to have good management. You have to be able to maintain uh, the organization, maintain your focus. You have to be able to um, maintain staff. That whole concept of being a, a solid uh, manager is an important aspect. And relying on a level of control, right? Managers have a level of authority in an organization to try to direct and uh, steer resources, steer people, steer activity uh, that certainly can be, uh, in, some way, in some ways, uh, a learned skill set. Mm -hmm. Certainly managers have a focus on systems and structure. Those of us who tend to be a bit more, let's do a whole lot of different things, that structure can be in terms of it containing, but um, it's important to be contained because we only have limited resources and limited time. So a good manager learns how to focus. What does Jim Collins say? Do what you do and do it really, really well. So I think that's a core element of being a good manager. Uh, managers tend to have the short-term versus the leader's long-term view because you've got to get done today what has to get done today. Um, and, and oftentimes it's focused on doing things right. Do what you, as Jim Collins said, do what you do well, but do it right mm -hmm. and get it right and keep systems in place. And the leadership side, certainly, they're innovative. Um, they're developing. They're thinking outwardly, right? They're thinking, what can I do to bring in resources? What do you need to do to make contacts in the community? They inspire trust. Um, they tend to do focus on people. Do I have the right people on the bus? Again, to quote Jim Collins mm -hmm. a little bit. If you haven't read the book, Good to Great, I encourage you to read the book, Good to Great. Um, they are focused on the long range. Mm -hmm. um, but again, managers do the things right. Leaders tend to focus on do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, some Making ethical decisions as a leader can be incredibly challenging. Um, doing what's right always seems like, of course, I'm going to do what's right, but it can be in a you have a lot of decisions to make as a, as a leader, regardless if you're the ED, program director, a division director. There are a lot of decisions you need to make in, in, in your professional life. And, and so a leader pays attention to that. Mm -hmm. Because we're typically in community action, hugely grant funded, many of them with federal and state pastors. This discussion of managers and leaders isn't just um, an airy sort of discussion. We really have to be good at both. We do. Management of grants is very much a how are we going to do it, when are we going to do it, who's going to do it, how do we color within the lines? Because once you accept grant funding, you've got some lines. Now, thinking about a new program and writing a grant to get that program is the flip side of this management leadership coin. Developing something new on the ground and then looking for funding to make it happen. If you've been through the Roma training, you'll remember the Roma cartoon <laughs> that says, great, we got the grant. Now what? Oh. That's not how this right. works. You know, managers manage the ongoing functions. This is what the organizational standards are all about, yep. is having strong organizations. Leaders then do that. And at different times, you know, we joke about having two hats, our leadership hat and our management hat, and they're both very close at hand at all times because we have to be able to shift in those roles. But to keep ourselves from going nuts, you do have to know which role you're in at any given time. Am I in the final year, week of a grant cycle having to get things done? I'm, be, I'm acting as a manager. Am I planning for the next cycle and thinking about where we're going? Acting as a leader. Related functions, different perspectives. Give some thought to this and have some thoughts in your small group about how this works together. Let's talk, though, because this is really about emerging leadership. Management, some of the videos we're, you know, we have for you in the series, as well as your ongoing daily activities and conference training. This is one of the best quotes about leadership in my personal book, book of quotes. It's, you don't manage people, you lead people. Now, we have just finished saying there are times when, in fact, you manage, 
But this is the goal of leadership, it's to make productive every, everybody's strengths, to look for what's great. Of course, it doesn't mean we're not going to coach people and, and work on skill development. So what it means is we're going to use everyone to maximum capacity and find ways to make all those skills useful. Really, when push comes to shove, the leadership isn't about your needs. Right. As a leader, you really have to adapt and get a sense for um, what the folks around you really need. What, what do they respond to? How do you nurture and encourage folks? Because you can't do everything, so you have to motivate people in order to do a number of things on their own. You want them to be independent. So it's, it, you're right. It's less about you, and it's more about the people you're working with. And different situations need different types of styles. There's, just because it works this way in one situation, you need to be flexible. And not, you know, that, that, that takes some practice. That maybe means stepping in it sometimes where you haven't done it the right way and learning from those experiences. And trust us, there's a, a, another little aphorism I love, which is wisdom is the booby prize given when we've been unwise. Uh, yep. Typically experience comes from putting our foot in it right. somewhere. And once in a while from seeing someone else put their foot in it and resolving not to go near that particular mud puddle. <laughs> Traditionally, um, and in the literature around leadership, these are the six styles that we commonly refer to. Now, sometimes the names change. We want to walk you briefly through each of these. There is, in fact, the visionary style, coaching, affiliative, democratic, pace setting, and commanding. Let's talk a little bit about each one because there is a place for every one of these in all of us as leaders. And people sometimes ask about a preferred style, and I would refer you back. It's less about your preferred exactly. style than mastering them all. Because in a crisis, what do you need? You need somebody who can take command and make it happen. When you're looking to, to build consensus, though, that style is completely useless. So let's talk very briefly about each one. Visionary. Um, certainly when an organization is setting the course for the future. If you've been involved in strategic planning conversations at your organization, you appreciate the visionary leaders in the room. Although sometimes the manager side of you is like, oh, that vision can get us too far off track sometimes. But a visionary person is really helpful when you're looking to set the direction of the organization. Helping people move toward a common sense of purpose and, and moving the organization um, ahead together, um, which can be a challenging community action, right? Because we all have our different pieces and we're trying to de-silo across the network. So as our up-and-coming leaders, it's going to be incumbent upon you to Find a way to make this leadership style work for you in some way, shape, or form, because you're going to have to rally the troops. And if not today, down the path, um, you will find yourself in this situation. And there are great visionary leaders in our network. Mm -hmm. you know, we have leaders um, like David Bradley and Don Mathis at the partnership, Eleanor Evans, new leader CEO of Capital at the mm -hmm. time of this recording, whose job it is to get out in front and kind of help us focus that in boards, in your CEOs. We see this a lot, but visionary leadership isn't limited to those sort of high-profile roles. It's the person who, in a strategic planning session, kind of puts their hand up and says, have we thought about this? And no one has. So this trickles all the way down. You really do need to think about this, because this is about how we get where we're going. Uh, what path do we want to choose? Um, now, we say on this slide, it's, you know, it doesn't say how it will get there, but in the sense of are we going to do, are we going to look at independent uh, families, support? Mm -hmm. Are we going to look at the skills-based model? Are we going to look at family development models? How do we want to look at self-sufficiency? So there's lots of ways to do this. One that we're uh, familiar with most of us, because it's been used on us as we develop, mm -hmm. is coaching leadership. This is exactly what it means. This is the coach rallying the troops, uh, focuses on developing individuals. Here's how to do it. Why don't you try this out, uh, moving it forward in terms of helping people get better. But coaching presumes that people want to improve. Right. Okay? Coaching is what we do. Mentoring is a little bit different. Denise mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, and we will talk about that distinction a little more. Um, but coaching really does presume that people want to develop professionally. So as you're coaching, emerging leaders tend to be hungry for coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, we want people to show us the next step. Where can I go? What can I do next? How can I make my skills most useful to the agency while still developing as a leader. So it really focuses on developing people. 
Now let's talk about affiliative leadership. This is really the team-based concept, right? Um, that we really think that and look at ourselves as part of a team. How do we organize ourselves? And in community action, we really have a unique opportunity. And as emerging leaders, you have folks who have come decades before you who have really nurtured this concept of community action, that we are a network. We're not a bunch 1,100 standalone organizations. We are a network-wide with infrastructure and connectivity across this country. We are a team, um, and it's your job as emerging leaders to try to continue that sense. So using affiliative leadership in your, in your development, I think, is a, is a key strategy. Certainly, we can talk more about the CCAP, the Certified Community Action Professional Option uh, for developing leaders, but that certainly, for me, got that sense of team for me, and I think developed my leadership style to help convey that sense of team to others. Um, and again, it can be really be helpful to heighten that sense of harmony and increase morale. And if there's not a time where we need folks to feel connected as a, as a larger group and not to feel isolated, it's a time when we're under possible budget crunches, we're under um, possible kind of pushes and, um, and pressure on us as a network to mm -hmm. perform at a higher level or at least demonstrate that we're performing at a higher level, that the standards that are coming down, what kind of pressure is that putting on some of our administrative capacity? So knowing that we're doing it together and that we are a team mm -hmm. and have a broader impact, having this style of leadership is an important thing to have in your toolbox. I couldn't agree more. I, you know, in times of travail and trouble, whether it's network-wide or in an agency, building consensus around the table um, is critical. It's, it's important when you're just looking at a new strategic direction or bringing people along. Um, but really, there's nothing better for repairing um, trust, as Denise mentioned, in an organization. And we see that especially, and it's not even a case of breaking trust, just new leaders and the turnover in leaders as the baby boomers retire. Um, this, is, this is really something you're going to want to have a handle on. Democratic leadership really is um, a little different from team-based, and sometimes it's hard to see the differences. It's really taking people's knowledge and skills around the table, creating a group's commitment, and looking for ways to move the organization forward. I haven't seen this as much in action with community action. We tend to see a more team-based approach mm -hmm. and occasionally sort of some command and control at the end of, okay, based on the three options, here's what we're going to do. And of course, boards of directors have a lot of say when it comes to direction. But the democratic process, when there are two different ways to go and both are pretty much okay, this is a great way to do it. This is a, a way to spread out the decision-making to your team, whether that's the executive director's leadership team or as an emerging leader, whether that's the team you have working with you on a project and say, what do we all think we should do? Let's talk it out, and if we're not coming to consensus, let's sort of move to a democratic model and say, let's make a choice that way. So a good tool to have in your toolbox, it doesn't come up as often as some of the others in the everyday efforts of managing an organization. It does come up more when you're choosing paths to follow, I think. And we keep talking about Jim Collins and Good to Great. Um, he has a, a smaller monograph called Good to Great in the Social Sector, and he actually it's a quick read. It's cheap online. You can get it really. Um, it's a great, great read and investment of your time. But he talks about, especially in the nonprofit world, um, that because you're not the CEO of a corporation and you own all and get to decide all, that board nuance is an incredibly unique aspect to um, the nonprofit world. And how do you, and if you have a good democratic leadership style, how do you get all of those bodies on the board herded down a direction that you think the organization needs to go? Now, Board certainly set the tone from the top, right? But as a, an executive director or even program director working with the board, mm -hmm. being able to navigate that board of directors issue is a clearly a democratic leadership style. Very much so. And I, I hadn't thought of it that way, but you're quite correct. Pace setting leadership. This is something um, that you need to actually be aware of. <laughs> um, I'm going to say that just right up front. This is generally what emerging leaders do. You get out in front, you set high standards for performance, and you want things done better, faster, more efficiently, more effectively. That doesn't sound like anybody in this room, does it? No, not, no, at, not all. at all. Nobody. Nobody we know either. And we can tell you from experience, this can be challenging for other people. It can also be incredibly energizing in the right setting. But the reality is that people work at different paces and speeds. People's minds move more quickly or less quickly to new ideas. This is a... Um, only a yellow light, not in the sense of slow down, but in the sense of caution. Mm -hmm. um, that setting the bar too high, unfortunately, leads to people just giving up and saying, well, I could never do that, so why would I bother trying? 
whereas a little coaching might get them sort of up to that level. But setting that tone, yeah, see, this can be done, mm -hmm. can be very powerful. Okay. And also, you have to take care of yourself. And you can live in this moment sometimes, and sometimes you do need to have this skill in your pocket, as Will was talking about. You need to be able to do this. But if you're, if you're this 24-7, you will burn yourself out. And again, we're probably not the best people to talk to this necessarily, but you have to be conscious that you have to use the other skill sets as well. You, you can't always be, the bar has to go higher, we have to go higher, we have to go higher. Mm -hmm. That's rather like saying we must reduce our administrative costs every year to be more effective. Well, if you reduce them every year, theoretically you end at zero and no organization can function well that way. It's the same with our personal energy reserves. Mm -hmm. um, we are taping this at the end of the year of the organizational standards, so our cautions are well-founded. We ask that you believe us that you will, in fact, come to a point where you just can't keep up that energy forever. And commanding leadership. Um, this is, again, something in community action and probably in the nonprofit world in general that's not going to be taken out of the toolbox very often. But there are times, and it, talk about the classic military style leadership, right, top down. Mm -hmm. I, you're going to do it because I said you're going to do it. And sometimes in the executive director role, program director role, there are times when mm -hmm. There, the situation calls for we're going to just do it, we're going to go down this road. You look at um, an emergency situation, people need to be responsive and a leader needs to feel comfortable taking control in those situations to direct staff and just mm -hmm. direct resources and be ready to respond quickly. So this isn't something that we would recommend, especially in community action, that you bring out of the box all of the time, but it is something that you need to be thinking about in your skill development, your comfort level, and putting yourself in situations and practice this where you need to be in charge of something so you can have this sense of dipping your toes into this water. As we move into the next section of generational leadership, we're going to talk a little more about this because different generations accept different styles of leadership better than others. Bear in mind what we're going to talk about is generalization to a great degree, but at the same time, um, you really want to bear this in mind because sometimes uh, generalizations are true for a reason because mm -hmm. it kind of often works yeah. that way. One last thing, we talk about this as a military style. Um, it is worthy of note, and those of you who may have come out of a military background or may um, do National Guard service can mm -hmm. attest to this, the military is actually a proving ground for a lot of leadership style testing mm -hmm. around different types of leadership. Some of the best work coming out on leadership in the past decade, um, a lot of good stuff has come out of the Department of Defense around different styles of leadership and saving the commanding leadership for when, in fact, it really is that way. But that's sort of our, always our mental picture of how that work mm -hmm. is, you know, that top down. And it is in a sense of here are the orders and here's how to follow them. But how things get done, they've really done some neat work. So there's some of that in our resource bank as well. Let's talk a little bit about the generations in community action. We are fortunate. Um, this is, and there aren't a lot of traditionalists left in the workforce, but heaven help us, there are them, really. There are in community action because people fell in love with community action. They came to it with a passion for doing anti-poverty work. And unlike a lot of other networks, a lot of our traditionalist leaders, and we'll talk about the age ranges, have stayed with us mm -hmm. as opposed to bouncing into other networks and doing things, as have the boomers, Gen X, and the millennials, or what we often call Gen Apps, which is my favorite. Uh, the wired generation, lots of ways to talk about it. There is some sociological debate as to whether the millennials and Gen F have now actually split into a further generation. For the purposes of this discussion, we're going to keep them in as one because, frankly, of that youngest contingent, there aren't a whole lot in the workforce yet. Um, so as we move into this, just bear with us as we, as we uh, put those two groups still into millennials. When we say traditionalists, we're talking about Tom Brokaw wrote about the greatest generation. Uh, this is also known as the World War II generation, the silent generation, mm -hmm. typically born on the 20s to the mid-40s, currently now 60s to late 80s. Um, some still obviously in the workforce. We have directors in their 80s around the mm -hmm. network. We have lots of directors in their 70s. Defining events, we all have them in every generation. The events that define this generation are what you see on the screen. They either lived through or their parents did um, the Great Depression. So these are people who save boxes and string and rubber bands, although I'm guilty of saving rubber bands too. There's a lot of crossover in generations, okay? These are guidelines, not firm and fast. The stock market collapse, Black Friday, um, remembering what happened when the whole country basically went into a tailspin. The advent of the atomic bomb, okay? Up until then, warfare 
and violence to a great degree was personal, and it was very personal. You could, generally speaking, you could see the people you were, you know, in war with. The A-bomb started to change that, and we're going to see as the generations come, the perception of danger and how safe we are in our world shifts with each generation. General characteristics of traditionalists. They, oh, they, they, well, you can see here, they tend to be reliable, very frugal. You mentioned saving everything. Right? Um, very, very frugal, very patriotic um, as a generation In, in kind of well. a traditional sense. Traditional of, you sense. Know, standing for the flag and, and really believing deeply in that. Hard working. Um, we'll talk a bit more about this, how that plays out in the workplace, certainly. And that strong set of a moral obligation, which I think also plays out in the workplace, which is why you see a lot of traditionalists have been in community action for so long. Mm -hmm. Workplace behaviors uh, for traditionalists. Here's what you would typically see. A traditionalist in general see, would be loyal to an employer. Okay? This is still the folks who lived, although they've gotten more cynical like all of us, in the era of you work for a company, your career, and then the company takes care of you. You know, the era of pensions. Not so much in community action where we have retirement accounts, but still. They tend to have effective and very warm personal skills. Um, they tend to be very down to earth. To them, a work ethic means timeliness. It means putting in your hours and working hard during that time. Okay? It's, it's a time-based, hard-working ethic, but it's very much about being present in the work. Very willing to learn. A surprising number of traditionalists have done real well with technology. Um, a lot of it driven by grandchildren, admittedly, um, or, or workplace changes. But they are very willing to learn. Because of the generation they came out of, when you know people did accept command and control mm -hmm. sort of more in the 20s and 30s, here's how society is ordered, and here's what we do, they tend to accept that style relatively easier than other generations do. Let's move on, though, to the generation of many of our CEOs and board members. Let's talk for a little bit about the baby boomers. Um, this is the generation you see the, the cartoon, How Do You Panic a Baby Boomer? You know, bad acid in the 60s and uh, bad assets in the recession. Baby boomers were typically born as the children of the traditionalists, mm -hmm. even a little bit before, and born in, or now in their 50s and 60s. Uh, do the math from the years on the screen. Defining events, Kennedy and King assassination, Woodstock, um, the whole civil rights movement is encompassed in this, uh, Vietnam, warfare at the dinner table, 6 o'clock news with you know, shots of ongoing um, violence, the feminist movement came about at the same time. The advent, speaking of watching things on television, the advent truly of television in a broad availability sense. And of course, the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Somebody once said you can define a generation by its villains uh, in most cultures. And in ours, who were the villains of films during this time? They always had a Russian or a Slavic accent. Mm -hmm. You know, James Bond's uh, villains were always Spectre, and you know, you had different people. But the villains were very tangible. But the Cold War had that effect on people. We'll talk a little bit about their general characteristics. Um, and if you are a boomer or you know boomers, hopefully this, these will resonate in some ways. And again, these are just general characteristics. Um, optimistic and driven. Um, the, the, the boomer generation, the world was their oyster, right? They were the biggest generation to ever come through, and the world kind of had shifted as the boomers aged. And we're seeing that today with shifts in, in health care and in all those sorts of things. So their impact is not going to go away anytime soon, but um, they are very optimistic as a group. There used to be in the focus of the center of attention, right? When you're the biggest group, you get the attention. The media, um, shopping, styles were driven by what the boomers um, were, were looking for. So they're kind of used to being that center of attention. Um, value that individuality, that me generation um, aspect, resistant to traditional aging. We have the boomers to thank, certainly, for the breadth of, of skin care products that we have <laughs> available nowadays um, to certainly help us. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, was 60s the new 40 or something like that? So mm -hmm. you can really see that um, playing out and trying to have it all, um, work, family, trying to balance it all, mm -hmm. which we all know is hard to do. But the baby boom generation was the first to right. say, hey, we can do it all. We can work. We can have families. We can have men doing housework and women doing business work. We can do it all. Um, their workplace behaviors are linked, as are all of ours, mm -hmm. to our personal behaviors. And again, one more time generalizations. The closer you are, by the way, to one end or the other of a time period, the more likely you are to share characteristics with the previous generation, or if you were particularly tight with your grandparents, 
of a gen- of a certain generation. For instance, I still know all the World War One songs because you know my grandmother knew them and sang them to me. That kind of thing. But in general, these typically resonate for audiences pretty well. Workplace behaviors is that work comes first. Everything else takes a back seat to work. They tend to be also very loyal to the company. Work ethic is similar to the institutionalist with a twist, working long hours, working hard, but also being observed doing it. Um, your baby boomer is going to be somebody who wants to be seen doing that work because it only counts, as we, all, we always say, with services to clients. If you don't measure it, it doesn't count, right? Well, the same for the work ethic here. If you're not seen putting in the hours, then no one knows and it doesn't count. Uh, they believe in Champion and they really do evaluate others on their work ethic. We're going to talk a little bit in a minute uh, as we get through Gen X and the Millennials about things, but how often have you heard someone from this generation perhaps say, well, those Millennials, they just don't have a work ethic? Well, they do, but it's not the same work ethic, and we're going to talk about that. This isn't to fix any one generation. We all have our challenges and we all have our opportunities within generations. It's to understand the perspective of the other generations. We all have a pretty good handle typically on our own. Um, but to understand that that conversation needs to take place. If you're having a challenge with a boomer around a work ethic, it helps to realize their work ethic is long hours, hard work, and being seen, whereas a millennial will say, hey, I got the job done, I did it fast, so I took off for the afternoon. Neither one is wrong, but it, there can be a real conflict with being aware of these challenges that's the purpose of this information. So, focusing on teamwork and relationship building, uh, boomers are the kings and queens of meetings. Working hard to advance and putting in your time, which is one of those things that if you are a millennial or a Gen X or listening to this recording, you know will make your hair stand on end. It's like, but I'm good at this now, and why can't I just do it? Well, you have to put in your time. This is a generation that says you really need to put in your time, which doesn't mean that they can't understand that people can do it better and that younger generations can't say, well, there is an element of that. Again, it's being aware. Gen X, which we both have the uh, honor to inhabit, is uh, sort of typified by this cartoon. We'll let Denise talk a little bit about Gen X. <laughs> um, Gen X, born between 65 and 1980, um, 30s and 40s. My guess is many folks watching these videos are going to be Gen Xers. Mm -hmm. Um, also, certainly on both other sides, we have boomers who self-select as, as emerging leaders, even though they may be more seasoned as, as professionals in, in the past. We also have millennials coming up, up the pipe, mm -hmm. certainly. But my guess is a lot of you are Gen Xers. Um, we're in our 30s to our late 40s. <laughs> Very right, yeah. 40s. Yeah. And our defining um, events, right, challenger explosion. We, I remember where I was sitting when, when that mm -hmm. happened. Um, STD and AIDS, we were the first generation where before sex would get you pregnant, possibly, um, certainly. <laughs> yes. Um, you could use um, certain medication to get rid of certain STDs, perhaps. But in the 80s, it became that sex could kill you um, with the advent of HIV and AIDS. So that certainly had an impact on how the extras developed. Um, the energy crisis, remember people taking bats to um, cars and waiting in lines at uh, gas stations um, with parents, certainly. Computers, we were the first ones to have computers in our classroom. Computers, um, not quite in our dorm rooms, maybe, although probably late extras mm -hmm. did have computers in their dorm rooms, certainly. And latchkey kids, we were the first generation to certainly not have working moms. There have always been working moms, but to be kind of framed up as those latchkey kids, I went home to an empty house. So mm -hmm. it became much more of a middle class mm -hmm. phenomenon for those of us in Gen X. Um, typically, um, Working class and poor people often had working parents um, of all of both genders. But in this case, this is starting to now spread to middle income households, and you start to see a nation responding to that, whether it is with ads and television and programming, um, whether it is about um, TV dinners and the way we eat and relate as families. Things really started to shift here. General characteristics of, of, of our generation, <laughs> we tend to be balanced. We tend to work well independently. The whole working in teams in school thing hadn't quite caught on yet. You still did your own work. Um, that is not as much the case for millennials, and it's the us and the education system who did it. Mm -hmm. But we weren't as team focused. We tend to be adaptable. The world has shifted so much from when we started elementary school uh, in Gen X to now. 
Now, that's true of every generation, but we were formed during the years of those shifts, which means we don't expect it to be the same. It never has been the same. Each year has been a big challenge for us technologically um, from a safety perspective, you name it. We tend to be cautiously optimistic. Well, we think it can get better, but we've seen a lot of things that make us think that, you know, it's not always a given. Skeptical, a little hesitant sometimes. Very comfortable with technology as a group. Not quite uh, born in the bone the way it is with millennials, and we'll talk about that, but we tend as a group to be very comfortable with updates. We tend to be pretty good at t t troubleshooting our own technology. We rarely call for tech support when all we need to do is install a printer driver. Um, we tend to know what we're doing on that as a generation. Theoretically, we work to live, or work, work to live, not to live to work. Um, we do try to find more of a balance in our lives than generations before. Um, we typically will reject that boomer traditional definition of a work ethic, that we have to be in the office at all times, proving ourselves with the hours upon hours of work. Um, we get the job done when we get it done, and we'll get it done fast, we'll get it done correctly. Um, we do tend to value talent and ability over longevity. So, and many of you are becoming or have become supervisors in your own field, and hopefully you're reflecting what you value in your own leadership skill development for folks also that you're working with. Um, do you make sure that you encourage others and, and demonstrate that you value their tech talent um, and ability, not so much how long they've sat in that chair? Mm -hmm. And they're loyal to a person, typically, not a job or a company. Although possibly in community action, we might be a bit more um, boomer-like, boomer um, tend to really believe in the passion of community action. But oftentimes it is that leader that we have had in our life, our mentors, mm -hmm. our executive directors who, who are giving us um, that, that direction. And we see that in community action. We see people following a charismatic uh, leader who goes to the, they're an executive director position in another agency. Sometimes staff will go with them. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely we see this. As we start talking about the millennials or Gen At, um, Gen Y has been used, and I'm not sure even what they would be calling the kids who are like being birthed now. We'll undoubtedly have to find new, new letters or acronyms. Uh, these kids really were almost born with technology in their hands. We are talking about folks who were born after 1980, so 30, actually 33 and younger now. Their defining events have been terrifying. Um, and in light of how they are as a generation, it is, it is amazing to me that they're as optimistic as they are given their defining events. Columbine, so you're not safe in war, we all know that. You're not safe in the air with Challenger. Schools now are not safe places. Um, I'm gonna skip down a bullet, 9-11, um, September 11th, 2001, and the Iraq War. War is not just here, it's here in our neighborhoods. I mean, people are literally being called up from the National Guard and being sent in again. Uh, these people actually have a fair bit in common with traditionalists. They've seen a generation, they've seen their parents go to war in a way that uh, the boomers, to, for the most part, and the Gen Xers, Gen Xers certainly have not. Technology, internet, texting, cell phones, instant messaging, whatever the cusp of it is, we should be adding um, Instagram, Twitter, um, pin it, uh, Pinterest, Pinterest, yeah. uh, see, even we don't know. Um, these are all... Technologically, if you want to answer, you go ask a millennial as to what's hot and what's not. General characteristics of millennials. Again, they do tend to be optimistic. Um, they have a lot going on in their lives, and they do tend to, again, like you said, given the history and the defining moments in history for their generation, it's great to see it as optimistic as folks are. They do value that freedom and autonomy. Um, they want to be able to give in a task and go run with it. And as an extra, I think we can empathize with that. Um, but I do think they tend to want that even more, perhaps, than, than the extras uh, do. Uh, the global outlook, they want to make the world a better place. Um, you do see a lot of the, in the research saying that uh, Gen Y are much more in terms of volunteering, uh, donating to organizations. So as you look to new ways to help your organizations do fundraising or engaging younger folks in activities, keeping in mind that that generation may have more of a likelihood to be engaged in those activities than, than previous generations. Mm -hmm. And they do um, like that immediate gratification, not across the board, right? These are general uh, characteristics, but in the days of like, when you like on Facebook within minutes of someone posting something, very quick turnaround time for that appreciative uh, factor. And relating well to traditionalists, um, um, having similar experiences certainly in, in some of the uh, core elements of their lives and certainly mm -hmm. the impact of war on a generation uh, will have a lasting impact. Mm -hmm. 
workplace behaviors. Now, this is where we start to get into it. Um, most of the conflicts that I've certainly seen in community action that have been brought up in sessions that we teach around this and other issues are around boomer to Gen X or boomer to millennial. That's where the scratchiness seems to most often need some sandpaper. Okay? Uh, think of this as your sandpaper. Workplace behaviors, millennials value meaningful and fun work. They can recognize, as can we all, that drudgery sort of getting the data input stuff has to happen, but that's not what they're going to value. They tend to be very loyal to the people that they work and play with, and they often see that as the same group. They don't see it as a group or generally appreciate this whole distinction of my personal life versus my work life. It all kind of melts uh, for this. They want to learn and grow, but they want rewards now. Now, rewards do not always have to be cash or tangible. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a second when we talk about how to reward and work with each group. Um, but they do want rewards quickly. As you said, instant messaging. Email is even considered too slow by a lot of millennials. It's like, well, text me or send me a tweet or message me um, things. All of this stuff is instantaneous communication. Achievement-oriented, they want to get to goals. And they see technology as a necessary part of the work environment. Um, for those few agencies, I'm not sure there are many left who've you know, banned social media in the workplace, um, this group is not going to be interested in sticking with your agency. Um, technology and relatively up-to-date technology is a key part being able to do social media. Now, the upside of this, of course, is turn your social media over to your millennials and it will be sharper than most uh, other agencies. Definition of a work ethic is still really emerging. It tends to look a little bit more, though, like the Gen Xs. Get it done right, get it done fast often working in teams. Um, this group really values teamwork um, because, again, we taught them that in school. Everything was done in teams. My, I'm, a, I'm a very early, I was born on the first day of Gen X and my kids are millennials. Everything in school was about who all was on your team um, and doing that. We see that a lot going around. So you may have to uh, print this presentation, which accompanies, of course, all the videos. When we look at what people want for rewards, acknowledgement, how they say thanks, how they communicate, and what they're looking for in a work environment. So take a look as we, as we sort of stroll through this just a little bit. Traditionalists tend, for in terms of being rewarded for work, pins, certificates, um, plaques, tangible recognition of the time and the work that they've put in, it tends to be how they appreciate being rewarded. Now if we look at the boomer generation, their rewards are a little different. Mm -hmm. They tend to want promotion, recognition, and money. Remember, this is a generation now that's nearing retirement or is in retirement, and uh, cash on the barrel head is typically very important to them as a, as a group. Gen Xers, it's still money, but it's also time away from work. It's saying, hey, that was great. Why don't we close early on Friday? as, you know, close the department down and everybody take a half day. We got it done, we got it turned in, the grant is in, whatever it is. Millennials, uh, Gen Xers tend to really want that, as do millennials. Time off, flexibility, but instant rewards. Um, being able to have flexible workplaces where we can respond on the fly to, hey, I need to be at XYZ, but I'm going to finish this up tonight. This is the generation that wants that more than any other. Let's talk about acknowledging people. How do, how do people like to be acknowledged? Um, that sense of, um, when you start with the boomers here, that loyalty and um, recognizing and acknowledging the experience that someone has. And again, as you're emerging leaders, you're looking at this chart about both how do I navigate um, to other generations as a supervisor perhaps or as a supervisee. So you, you want to look at this both different directions. Mm -hmm. um, under um, the boomer side, um, looking at they like to have their skills acknowledged, um, certain expertises, certifications, mm -hmm. um, good hard work. Um, time served, certainly, as we talked about earlier. How long have you been at the agency? What kind of hours are you working? And acknowledging uh, that sort of uh, component. Um, acknowledging the speed and accuracy with which things get done in, in Gen X is important. They think they get things done quickly and get things done right. They're focused on that. So acknowledging, yeah, you did get that done quick. And boy, I'm, I appreciate that consistency of accuracy. And for, for millennials, that, that knowledge uh, and creativity and idea piece, making sure that folks are acknowledged for, for those skill sets they bring to the table. Mm -hmm. How do we say thanks? And this follows right along with what we said about generations. And again, bearing in mind, generally in generations, right. traditionalists, more than any other group, appreciate a handwritten note. 
That means pen, paper, <laughs> not a typewritten note, an email. Uh, I am, although we find that that also goes a long way with most generations. Mm -hmm. I save cards people Thank send you. me, and I know millennials have saved cards I've sent because people tell us so. Um, so that goes across the board, but traditionalists really appreciate that. Boomers um, like to be thanked with public recognition. Denise has done a great job on X, Y, Z. And, you know, this is the employee of the month stuff, which is, you know, faded. A lot of other people see that as kind of a retro mm -hmm. statement. Well, boomers are a little retro. It's okay. Gen X, uh, because of the individuality of that generation, the one thing, it's, they're like community action agencies. When you've met one, you kind of have met one individually, but with action. Time off, a recognition, a subscription to something professional development, um, some kind of action. Now, millennials, a quick email or an instant message, um, quick is the key word here. Mm -hmm. Again, if somebody's done a good job with a millennial, thanking them the next day or the day after won't have as much impact as shooting off a text. Yes, we, I called this presentation one time when done for a specific group of boomers. Yes, supervisors, you do have to text. Um, and it is a key to success in working with this generation. Just as it's a key for this generation to realize that a boomer likes something different or traditionalists like something different. It's about give and take. Speaking of give and take, communication. What do these groups typically prefer in, in, in how they communicate with others? We can see here the traditional is certainly that face-to-face -face, um, formal proper communication strategy tends to be the most effective mm -hmm. um, for in typical typical uh, traditionalists. Uh, whereas again, those boomers, that collaboration piece, um, still more formal than um, some of the younger generations. Certainly, um, group conversation, group communication, coming together um, for strategic planning retreats works well with boomers. Coming together for staff retreats, boomers do tend to do well in, in those situations because I think in many of those situations their leadership and experience is recognized and appreciated. So communicating that well can work can work good things. Um, under the Gen X, certainly being community oriented, we were the first really to have the email. The email, is that the right way to say it? Is that how the kids say it today? Um, but having email and website communication, but being open, direct, and honest. We want to get things done, done quickly and done right. We don't have time for fuzzy, be direct, be clear, um, be honest. Um, and the Gen Y, um, positive, friendly, as we were hearing earlier, electronic, IM, text, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it's going to be, what, find out what communication tool they're using and find ways to incorporate that into your toolbox. Mm -hmm. And last, preferred work environments. And again, community action is sort of a special case here. But in general, for the generation, Traditionalists tend to prefer very clear policies. What is, what is the acceptable way to do this in this company? Structure, looking at hierarchy, very much a top-down, what's the org chart look like, and it better look fairly traditional okay, to make somebody really comfortable. Um, boomers, they really are team-oriented, as they should be since they you know, raised the first millennial. And it really still is about that recognition, um, having a structure set up where people are recognized, whether it's a staff meeting or some other way. Gen Xers tend to prefer a flexible environment. Uh, flex time was invented for us, um, trying to balance, you know, as everyone does, the needs of family, work, volunteering, community life. Casual, fun, fairly individual. This is a group that does not like to be told what they can and can't have up on their cubicle walls. <laughs> And the same is true for millennials, flexible, collaborative in a way that the other generations have not seen before. Um, these guys are used to working in groups virtually on the computer network with some people in the room and some people not. They're the ones you see the tech commercials about with people working across the globe together. Uh, they collaborate extremely well and in fact sometimes struggle with the individual go, go to the cubicle and do this assignment piece. And very positive. Again, this group need to nurture that positivity and explain, which is not really on here. I think this is true for everybody, so I'll take us to our summary slide of what everybody wants, is to be appreciated for the qualities we bring, whether they are in line with what our technical generation is or not, to be respected by colleagues and coworkers. We all need flexibility, the more so as we're more and more sandwiched with parents and children and deep community needs, to really be seen as an individual mm -hmm. person. Um, but the key takeaway we'd like you to, to think about as an emerging leader as you go through the curriculum is communicate with people in the way they want to be communicated with and help them understand your preferred style 
because this really is a case of the golden rule. If you do unto others as you would like them to do unto you, in the sense of respecting your preferences. If I prefer email and someone else prefers a face-to-face -face conversation, I'm going to get better results if I recognize that and walk down the hall and ask for a meeting. If someone wants to, rec to get me quickly, they know that sending me a quick email saying, do you have time to talk about this, is a better approach. Of course, as a millennial, it might be a text. That's a simplified version to do it, but that really is the key, is understanding how people want to be communicated with, rewarded, acknowledged, and trying to honor their style. This is like leadership. It's more about their needs than our style. And that's true for each generation. Mm -hmm. Denise, closing words on that subject? Well, I think as you're emerging leaders and you're looking at your career path, knowing, knowing who's going to be able to control that future for you besides yourself. Are there people who you need to be able to communicate with very effectively because they're going to be the ones who are going to open those windows for you or give you new opportunities and new challenges to take on? Knowing what works best for them and adapting your style to theirs is going to be a critical aspect to help you move along that path. As well as, as well as mentioning, when you're supervising a team of people, you're going to want to be seen as a highly effective manager and a highly effective leader. And that takes maybe learning new skills on how to communicate with other generations. So that's a core element of why we have generations here, because understanding people is a huge aspect of being a leader and a manager in community action. And we hope that you have found this to be helpful as, as a grounding in some of these core elements. Yeah, there are books about everything we do in this series, and we're going to walk you through finally some of the pieces of this. But before we do, I want to talk just for one slide about coaching versus counseling. Coaching is specifically about performance. It's critiquing performance, helping people get skills development, rah rahing or in some cases ordering improvement. Um, provision of rewards and sometimes sanctions, you know, carrot and stick. Okay. Counseling, though, is about people. Often we talk about mentoring and counseling. There's not, often not a clear answer to, well, why can't that, say a millennial comes to you as, a, as an exer and says, well, why can't the CEO just see that if we could only be freed from this anti-social media policy, we could do all these things. Well, you know, and we need to help with that, but at the same time respecting the environment that we're in and recognizing that change is harder for some than others. That's a counseling moment. Coaching is to help them understand that distinction. The counseling is when you pro maybe privately agree with something. Okay? But there's no clear answers, but it's focused on people, on, on how they are reacting, because if you address problems without addressing emotions, it's not going to be a long-lasting solution for anybody. Um, if you can honor preferences and work through uh, preconceptions and reconceptions, mm -hmm. as I like to call it, this can really hold true. But as emerging leaders, you're in the position of both giving and receiving coaching and counseling a great deal, more, I think, than any other group of people. Regardless of what generation you're in, if you are emerging into your leadership role, you are going to be coaching people under you and counseling, you're going to be doing some coaching up, especially in regard perhaps to technology and social media, and maybe even some counseling up, which of course is trickier in some ways than that. So be aware though of when each one is called for. If it's a people issue, it's generally a counseling issue. If it's a performance issue, it's generally a coaching issue. Whether it's our issue as emerging leaders or someone else's issue that we're attempting to work with, be thinking about which one of these you want to employ. Now, we actually have some tools to offer you, and they can be found both, of course, here, but also in our Batter Up, Developing Your Leadership Bench Toolkit. There are a lot of different forms, surveys, and plans that are available in this book, um, and for, for free downloads from the Partnerships website, as well as the CSBGTTA.org website. One of the most important as you kick off your emerging leader program is to do the levels of leadership assessment. This is actually quite a short um, assessment. You pick a zero to four scale, so it's actually a five point scale, but zero for the mathematics here. And you can't read the questions here, you're not intended to, but this is what it looks like. So it's a very short thing. You can actually put this into SurveyMonkey and we have the ability to, uh, to shoot you the spreadsheet for that. Because what it wants people to do is talk about the different levels of leadership. And if you look at this page, which is uh, the scoring matrix, if you don't do it electronically, you can see on the top there are the areas of self-knowledge, coping with change, vision, mentoring, team building, and executive skills. This is not a full board. There are assessments that you can do a half day. This is a quick read on your strengths and gaps as an emerging leader. 
Now, if you want to make this the most valuable exercise possible, you both do it yourself individually, and then you access a team of people to do it as well with you, who then assess your assess you along those those tiered um, leadership areas that Lil mentioned. You would um, recruit two to four people, hopefully your supervisor, maybe your exec, maybe some peers, um, some mentors in, in, in your organization, or perhaps who know you really, really well. They would complete the similar form. And what you do really is then you compare and contrast your responses to this aggregate number of people who you respect who know you to see what is my internal look at my skills compared to what is that external look at my skills. Now, we have all gone through evaluations and you get that verbally, but to have something that really aligns up to bar chart, you know, bar charts basically mm -hmm. to get a read, wow, I really thought I, you know, I had a good self-aware enough of my mm -hmm. leadership skills or my executive skills or boy. Maybe I need to develop more confidence about some of my skill sets as well because maybe I don't think I'm doing as well as the people who I respect and who are judging me think that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. the, the, real, the best way to use this is to use the Excel spreadsheet which will then and use SurveyMonkey because then these people can be anonymous in a way that paper forms are sometimes challenging. It can be done, but you want them to be honest. This is not a tell me how good I am moment. This is tell me what you really think of my skills in these areas because we cannot improve what we don't know is a gap. Um, we like to say this about evaluations. Praise is good, but feedback's better. Mm -hmm. We want to know where we can improve. As emerging leaders, that's what we're striving for. Okay? Telling us we're doing great is wonderful. That's the fact. We all enjoy and need praise. But telling us where we can improve in a constructive way, and this isn't about job performance. This is about your skills as a leader. Levels of leadership assessment is what this is about, not levels of weatherization manager or Head Start teacher or development director or CFO. Okay? This isn't about those skills. That's your personnel evaluation, whole different ballgame. This is your leadership skills. And if you do, as Denise said, compare, you know, where you and your, your outside raters agree, you probably have a pretty good view of yourself. Where you're skewed that you think you're doing worse and they think you're doing better, again, think about that confidence. If it's skewed the other way where you think you're doing great and there's a, there's a consensus of opinion in your friendly raters that perhaps you could use some work there, it's something you need to consider. We all have blind spots. Mm -hmm. Finding them early is much less painful than finding them later under fire. The key tool that wraps all this together, though, is the individual development plan. Again, the form is in the batter up toolkit and available from us. Um, you can adapt it. You can adapt any of these any way you see fit. But as you do your levels of leadership assessment and as you go through the areas uh, that these webinars encompass that we talked about at the beginning, and as you think about the upcoming standards of, of organizations in community action, you're going to want to think about an IDP, an Individual Development Plan, that actually um, puts all that in one place for you to think about. Remember, this is not about your CFO skills as an example. This is about what you need to develop as a leader for the future. Now, can you morph your CFO pieces into it? Of course you can. It's your IDP. Do anything you want with it. But this is about your plan for leadership development. You may even have two. I have in the past sometimes had two. My personal leadership development plan and then kind of my um, position-based, here's the, things we, the skills we'd like you to develop in the next three years and as we start thinking about that. So sometimes it's necessary to have two. I find it easier if you can morph them. It doesn't really work that way. Why an IDP? Well, sometimes we say if you don't write it down, it never happened. <laughs> um, writing down an IDP helps nudge that process forward. We all have good intentions, but sometimes what's in writing is a little bit different. And if you put it into writing yourself, that's one thing. If your supervisor has put it into writing and it's in your file, that's another. But putting pen to paper, um, can be a powerful exercise um, to go down that road. Um, but that setting goals for yourself, and I like that fourth bullet, that accountability bullet. If it's written down, you get to check yourself against it. And many of us are our own worst critics, and we're the ones who are holding ourselves accountable for that. So it provides a sense of accountability as well to do something formal like this in writing. It does, and it's also a way to measure. And we're just going to show you the form on screen, very simple. Um, spreadsheet form, it's got expandable boxes, it's easy to do. It's not meant to be a dissertation. Nope. It's meant to be an expanded to-do list. And we all have to-do lists, right, whether they're electronic, uh, media, or on paper. Some of us have multiple to-do lists in different places, on post-it notes sometimes. We write things down so that they get done. 
so we remember to do them, and sometimes for the sheer pleasure of checking them off the list, knowing that we've accomplished something. This is the same way. This is meant to help you design a basic roadmap for your future. We hope that these emerging leader um, videos will help you develop skills in strategic planning and direction, communications, community relations, cultural competency. But if you find that you have an area where you're weaker than others, put it on the IDP. Say, I want to develop more skills in. If you're a program manager who's had very little exposure to budgets, you're going to need some fiscal knowledge to move forward in your career as a leader. Fiscal directors may well need other knowledge. They've been so schooled in the fiscal side of things, they may or may not have had time for the cultural competency videos or the strategic planning training or whatever it may be. So the form is yours to use to help you map your leadership future. Um, the whole series is going to continue to focus on that. We do some of the presentations. We have guest experts in for others. Um, this is a very generous network for sharing knowledge and information. So as you go through this, um, we wish you the best of luck on your journey. We look forward to being with you um, virtually and in person in many occasions. And we hope this is kind of a spurring, uh, whatever content you see in the videos, we really hope that you find a group. Hopefully you're doing this as a team, either in your agency or across the state association. Find times to gather and to talk and dialogue about things that you heard. Maybe you disagreed with us on a few things. That's great. Talk about it. Um, as adult learners, we see it, we read it. If we say it and dialogue about it, we tend to remember it better as adults. Mm -hmm. um, so I encourage you to use this as a starting point uh, to encourage your professional growth, to provide conversation topics, and um, let us know if we can be of any future help. If you're looking for direction for next steps, I recommend pulling up the Batter Up Leadership Kit, doing the levels of leadership assessment, starting in IDP, and then moving on into the video on public administration. Thanks so much for joining us uh, for the duration of the video. Best of good luck. Thank you.